Hello and welcome to Witch Please, a fortnightly podcast about the Harry Potter world. I'm Hannah McGregor. And I'm Marcel Cosman, coming to you from the land of dinosaurs, Drumheller, Alberta. And just to be clear, it's just me who's in Drumheller. It's not like a, it's not a reunion. I wish. I wish because first, I love dinosaurs. And second, this is a very appropriate recording location for today's episode, which is going to focus on monstrous women in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And obviously, my favorite monstrous women of all time are the lady dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about other kinds of monstrous women. And here to help us untangle this Medusa's hair of a topic, I don't think that's a very good metaphor, but I'm going with it, is special guest Jess Zimmerman. Hi, Jess! Hi, Jess! Hi, guys. Jess, pronouns she, they, is an editor at Quirk Books, a freelance writer, and the author of the brand new book, Women and Other Monsters, published with Beacon Press this very year. And it's really good. Welcome, Jess. Thank you so much for having me. I wish I were in the land of dinosaurs, but at least I can live vicariously. I may be in the land of dinosaurs, but Jess, you are a published author of a book with a beautiful cover, and we all know that that is how we judge books. And I really want to have an entire conversation about the fact that the cover is green, but we're going to head straight into the sorting chat. Well, let's start off the sorting chat with our standard guest question. Jess, what is your relationship, if any, to the Harry Potter series? So I don't have a ton of relationship with it because I am, like, very, very old <laughs> for in internet years. <laughs> like... Like, I am now at the age where, like, I'm older than everybody on the internet. So Harry Potter actually came came out when I was in high school, just going into college. And I actually read it, like, behind the counter at my bookstore job, which I did in high school and then in, in the summers in college. But I was reading it basically because I was like, oh, my God, the kids are so into this book. And we were all somehow already... Like, even even though, like, I started at this job several years before Harry Potter came out, I feel as though the entire time I worked at this bookstore, we not only had the books and people coming in for the books, but also we had, like, the jelly beans and the journal and the, like, toys and games and stuff like that. So I was finally essentially bullied by <laughs> just every child who came into the bookstore. And so I so I literally read the first four books, like, standing behind the counter just to, like, feel that I was somehow involved in this incredible cultural juggernaut. So that fell off a little bit because then I was in college and then I was like, okay, I've got assignment <laughs> stuff to be yeah. reading. Yeah. But so I, I have read all of them, but I haven't like really delved into them. I feel like those first four are the ones that, that I really paid attention to because they were, they were so ubiquitous in, in sort of my, my work life more than my personal life. Yeah. We're on a similar page because before we started making this podcast, I thought I had read all of the books at least once, but discovered in the process of the original run of the podcast that I, in fact, had never read the final book. I had just <laughs> seen the movie and kind of just put it together in my head. And it was exactly the same thing. It's because I started university and just, you know, didn't have time for, for leisure reading anymore. But I really, I really thought I'd read them all. See, I find this really funny because I read books for five, six, and seven when I was doing my undergrad. And that's probably why I didn't do as well in my undergrad <laughs> courses as I as I might have done had I done less leisure reading. <laughs> I mean, everybody, you, you got to have at least one thing that keeps you from doing your homework. And I definitely had those things. As it happened, they weren't Harry Potter books, but, you know... <laughs> Uh, IRC, for instance. Oh. <laughs> you heard it here first, kids. Whether you do leisure reading or not, you'll end up in exactly the same place in life. It's true. So you might as well do the leisure reading. You yeah. might as well do it. <laughs> <laughs> On a podcast? 
<laughs> that's where you end up in life. <laughs> yes. Whatever grades you get in your undergraduate, you're gonna end up on a podcast talking about Harry Potter. So just don't sweat it. Don't sweat it. Yep. This is this is the, the evolution of the 15 minutes of fame thing. It's that it, in the future everybody will be on a podcast at least once. Lucky them. <laughs> As much as I would like to spend our whole episode just talking about dinosaur facts, we'll do a bonus episode where we just talk about dinosaur facts. We have some other pertinent studying we need to do in revision. Today, in our episode, we're going to be talking about Monstrous Women, a fundamentally feminist reading that draws on the history of how women have been represented in cultural texts across history. So, unsurprisingly, we're going to continue to be feminists in this episode, (laughs) because can't stop, won't stop. But the biggest connection to previous readings that we've done is the idea of monstrosity as metaphor. Mm-hmm. So the biggest link I think we can draw here is to the previous monstrous metaphor we looked at, which is, of course, Professor Lupin and his lycanthropy, which I remember how to pronounce now because of <laughs> the song She-Wolf. Remember that Shakira song? This is the so when Taya Gerbeza joined us, we talked about werewolfism as a metaphor for disability or for chronic illness, and particularly looked at how gothic literature tends to use the trope of the monstrous other to signify the desire to exclude non-normative bodies from society. So like monsters have to be like shunned and cast out. And we talked about werewolves being this like particularly dangerous threat because of how their difference is hidden most of the month. So they can like, quote, pass as, quote, normal. I'm making so many scare quotes when I say those words you just can't see because it's a podcast. Uh, Audio mediums really lack the visual element, you know? (laughs) By definition, yes. (laughs) We took our reading of lycanthropy as a metaphor even deeper in the subsequent episode where we considered how the author's use of Lupin's werewolfism as a metaphor for HIV and AIDS actually perpetuates the very stigma that Rowling says she merely intended to explore. In that episode, we drew on Susan Sontag's book, AIDS and Its Metaphors, to help us understand how Lupin's representation encourages readers to accept the stigma associated with HIV and AIDS. The key section of the Harry Potter book being the part of the text when Lupin forgets to take his wolfsbane potion, becomes a werewolf, and then threatens the lives of children, rather than you know, using this metaphor as an opportunity to challenge the idea that people living with HIV AIDS are monsters. Mm-hmm. So some some struggles with the use of metaphor to do anything interesting there. <laughs> Lucky for us, we've got Lots more monsters to talk about in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. And lucky for you, I've created a handy chart to summarize them. A chart! But before we get into the details of this chart, I want to ask both you, Marcel, and you, Jess, the very important question of how, within the world of Harry Potter in particular, we define monstrosity. So, like, what's the difference between a monster and a creature? You know, Hagrid's textbook is called the Monster Book of Monsters, but it's the textbook for care of magical creatures. So it's monster, like, just another word for creature in this world, or does monster mean something else? It's a very good question. I would be inclined to, like, if I were setting up a fantasy world, right, and I wanted to make a distinction between those two things, I would would be inclined to think that a creature is non-sentient. And that a monster is sentient. But that doesn't sound like that's necessarily like what's in the textbook, for instance. And so it's maybe not like if you're if you're sort of a scholar within the world of Harry Potter, maybe you don't draw that distinction. But I feel like most of the time when we're talking about myth and folklore, there is there is some sense that a monster is even if it's not human level sentient, that it's has some ability to sort of think. And that can be what's very scary about a monster is that 
it can think maybe not as well as you can, but in the same way that you can. And so the two of you, you know, if you're, if you're fleeing from it or if you're fighting it, you don't have necessarily an advantage the way that you might with an animal. Yeah, like sentience makes a lot of sense in terms of thinking about like who gets to be a person in the wizarding world and who doesn't get to be a person and how that's actually like a legal distinction. There's this whole paratext around it that like leprechauns, for example, are sentient but never petitioned to be considered like people according to wizarding law they're in this sort of liminal space but like it does help to explain what the difference is between the mer people who live in the lake and like the blast ended scroots who you learn how to take care of in a class i don't want to be a dingus but i have a quibble (laughs) i have a quibble (laughs) with with sentience only dinguses have quibbles marcel (laughs) we often use the word sentient i think to mean in some kind of intelligence, but sentient actually just means like living and like having senses. And so like, I don't think we can use sentience as a distinction between monsters and creatures because like frogs are sentient, tadpoles are sentient. I was thinking more of like having a sense of self, right? Or having like some, yeah, self-concept. It's definitely like something around self-awareness, judgment, theory of mind, something around there. And I think, I mean, right away, the sort of fuzziness that we're all identifying around that boundary is one, you know, we've talked about it in our animal studies episodes, but it's one that always points to the fact that, like, when you are trying to distinguish between sentient and non-sentient, self-aware and not self-aware, intelligent and unintelligent, you got to choose somewhere to draw that line. And that line has historically been, like, used to do a lot of work. And one of the kinds of work it does, I think, is distinguish between monsters and animals. Like, what's a magical animal in this world? Theory of mind is a really interesting, like, place to draw that line, I think, because that, like, again, if we're talking about what makes monsters scary, like, a zombie is scary because even if it isn't exactly intelligent, it has some ability to, like, recognize you as an adversary and try to outthink you. I think zombies are a great example because like, that's how zombie narratives like pull at our heartstrings, right? Because you see this maybe person who you knew and who you were friends with and they are no longer, they're no longer there. Now you are not their friend. You are just like a tasty brain snack. And that doesn't feel good. (laughs) It doesn't feel good. And so many horror movies that focus on animals as the site of monstrosity are specifically about animals that have become unnervingly intelligent, like that incredibly important classic, Deep Blue Sea, where they (laughs) make sharks giant and then are amazed to discover that by making them giant, they also made them super smart because their brains are big now, which is not how intelligence works, but the movie's still perfect. I mean, speaking of dinosaurs, also kind of how it works in Jurassic Park. You know, if they weren't clever girls, it might not be quite as scary. They're much scarier. Like, the velociraptors are scarier than the T-Rex because the velociraptors are clever girls and the T-Rex just stomp and munch. Stomp, munch. That's all she does. (laughs) All right. So with that really clear distinction in mind, I think we did a great job. Let's take a brief look at some of our monsters in this series and maybe just start to float some wild theories about how we think they might be functioning metaphorically because I love floating a wild theory. So I think probably our primary monsters, the ones that I find the most interesting in this book are the Vilas, who are the mascots of the Bulgarian Quidditch team. Even though they do appear to be, like, fully sentient adult creatures that we later find out can, like, marry humans. So it's very strange that they are mascots. But they have some magic powers. Specifically, they can dance hypnotically. (laughs) And then when they get mad, they transform into bird-like harpy creatures and hurl fistfuls of fire at you. You know, Arthur Weasley articulates for us the function that Vila's serve in this world when he tells his children, (laughs) 
And that, boys, is why you never go for looks alone. So I guess the metaphor is that beauty is only skin deep. (laughs) Just wings and fire. (laughs) Wings and fire. And beaks. Wings, beaks, and fire. So many beaks. Don't love that. I actually, in the book that I brought with me on this trip, I didn't bring my hardcover copy that I have been reading. I brought my falling apart paperback copy. And when I reread the section at the Quidditch World Cup with the Vilas, I have a sticky note from when we talked about the Vilas in our original run where I write, I have a problem with the fact that there is an entire magical species that men are incapable of not objectifying. (laughs) I'm really excited to get to Transfiguration class so we can talk about Jess's essay about sirens, because, ooh, does that tie into how Vila's are represented? But let's just, let's just quickly get through some of our other monsters first. I think we could add into sort of potential monstrous category the half-giants who we encounter. So Hagrid and Madame Maxime, you know, we know that giants at least are monsters, and that being half-giant brings them at least proximate to monstrosity. And that becomes really clear in the book because it is dangerous information that is meant to be kept secret and that will risk their safety or their job security if it's found out. The only abilities or powers associated with it seems to be tall, which is honestly (laughs) my favorite form of monstrosity. No tall men, as we always insist. And I guess metaphor, like, Racism? Just sort of generic, like, people are afraid of people who are different, and that's bad. It seems to be sort of the moral of the half-giants. Yeah, and like, here is a very rational explanation for why that fear is legitimate. Yeah, so it's a more classic rolling. Um, It's bad to be biased, (laughs) but giants will eat you. Anyway, okay, here's maybe the most contentious inclusion. Dragons. So are dragons yeah. creatures or are they monsters? They don't have the kind of like human face that so often makes a monster a monster, the sort of like semi-humanity, but they are intelligent. So are they just big, smart animals or are they particularly animalistic monsters? This is a tough one. Because dragons are also very similar to dinosaurs. And dinosaurs are definitely creatures unless they're running rampant in a park (laughs) whose electricity has been turned off. And then they stop being creatures and start being monsters. So maybe a creature stops being a creature when it is in a place you don't expect. Oh, that's interesting. That, like, a creature becomes a monster. Another way a creature can become a monster is by becoming a peril that you have to face. Yeah. <laughs> like, a, like a mean mommy in a task. Like a mean mommy in a task. And that's what we've, uh, we've already established in our structuralism episode. That's what dragons are a <laughs> metaphor for. They're, they're mean mommies. So we've got a few more here. I've listed ghosts, maybe are monsters. I think mer people are pretty good candidates. We encounter them living under the water. All they seem to be able to do is live under the water and have tridents. So I'm not sure if there's much of a fully formed metaphor operating there. No. <laughs> And then, of course, we've got a sphinx, a classic monster. But, Marcel, you've added a couple more here. Sort of, sort of. I didn't tinker with your chart because it's a beautiful chart, and I'm really excited for the inclusion of Hannah charts in our scripts. But as I was thinking about, like, this distinction between creatures and monsters, I was thinking about the question that Malfoy asks when Hagrid introduces the kids to the blast-ended Scroots, and Malfoy asks three questions. He wants to know, why would we want to raise them? What do they do? And what is the point of them? And then, you know, like halfway through the book, Professor Grubbly Plank brings in unicorns for the students to have like a little petting zoo, I guess. And we are told that she is expounding on their magical properties, but we don't learn what those are. (laughs) So, like, 
I feel like the question is equally legitimate for, for unicorns. Why would we want to raise them? What do they do? And what is the point of them? You know, we learn in the first book that their blood has healing powers, but it's wrong to kill them. And so like, okay, so their their tails make really good cores for wands, but I would put money on the fact that a blast-ended Scroot's like stinger, stinger part would also make a really good core for a wand. So we've got something here. We've got something about like a creature is more monstrous when it's not useful. A creature is more monstrous when it is directing its intelligence against you. A creature is more monstrous when it's standing in your way or appearing somewhere unexpected. And what the sort of through line in these seems to be that we define things as monstrous when they get in our way. And that, I think, brings us effectively to the question of why women are monsters. (laughs) Oh my god. (laughs) Shall we head to transfiguration class? Yes, yes, we must go. (laughs) Now that we have a list of monsters and a perfect and flawless definition of monstrosity itself, (laughs) it's time for us to learn a little bit more about monstrous women. And that's what we're going to do in transfiguration class. So Jess, (laughs) could you start us off by talking about your book, Women and Other Monsters? Where does your fascination with monstrous women come from? I wish I had like sort of a simple explanation for, oh, this is like, this is my origin story with with these monsters. And I guess the closest thing that I have to an origin story with them actually is that I was extremely, and I bet some of you were too, extremely into Dolaire's Book of Greek Myths when I was a kid, (laughs) um, which is like really kind of the, the tome for a certain kind of little weirdo. So all of the monsters um, that I look at in the book, I know I, I brought up, you know, both zombies and dinosaurs, but all of the ones that I look at in the book are from classical Greek myths. For a number of reasons, the main one of which is that, like, those have had a really outsized influence on Western culture, and we sort of still look to those stories in a lot of ways for where we're getting what what we think of as as culture, you know, what we think of as, like, great literature, what we think of as great art is very, very rooted in a lot of these stories, and and so so is sort of a lot of my understanding of, like, what is a good story and what is, like, interesting. I was very, very into these stories when I was a kid. But what I don't remember is sort of the moment of being like, you know, a lot of these monsters are girls. <laughs> um, and I do, I should, I should take a moment. I have, like, an author's note about this in the book, but it's, but it's always worth saying that, like, when I say women, like, that is a very, I use that as a very, very broad category. Like, that's, that's people who identify as women, but it's also people who, you know, are feminized externally. Anybody who is who is seen as a woman, no matter how they identify. Also sometimes cis men, because the way that men are kind of wrangled by the patriarchy is also defined by misogyny. So it's sort of anybody who has womanhood thrust upon them. And the book does a very good job of distinguishing between, like, biology and gender. Like, not conflating those things, because being socially feminized while it is linked to some biological functions, is not identical to it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these monsters are gendered as female. Some of them don't even have, like, an animal body, you know? So they don't they don't really have... Charybdis is a whirlpool, you know? So she she doesn't have, like, any any kind of biology, but she's still gendered as as feminine. And I think that was one of the things that made me sort of sit up and take notice like oh this is this is an explicitly feminized monster that is a wor- that is a bad a bad <laughs> tide <laughs> yeah that is that is literally just like a whirlpool in the water and that's true of of a lot of them they they often have like partially human and partially animal or partially you know or different kinds of animals um so there's very sort of hybrid biology entirely a bird but it has tits so yeah, frequent frequently the tits are the are the marker, but but sometimes sometimes not. <laughs> frequently the tits is 
absolutely going to be the title of my memoir. But one of the things that's really interesting about these monsters that goes back to what you were saying about Vila's is that they became sort of more, became uh, depicted as more and more human and more and more beautiful sort of over time. And it's giving you kind of that same, you know, subtext of anybody could be very, very scary underneath. Anybody could be all wings and beaks and you shouldn't trust this sort of beautiful facade. And so you see that with like Medusa starts out having, you know, tusks and a beard and sometimes wings, claws, all of that. And then winds up when we see her depicted today, we have like that statue that was going around on Twitter that has like kind of a swimsuit model body and like no pubes, you know? (laughs) So do you have a theory about why so many classical monsters are represented as female? I can't, like, I can't speak to what, you know, Ovid was actually thinking, you know, or Homer or whoever, because, you know, I'm not a classicist. I'm a person who, like, like what you guys are doing with Harry Potter, you know, I'm reading these stories and then I'm sort of putting my own interpretation on them. But the way that they function, these stories, and maybe the way that they were meant to function, but certainly the way that they do function is as cautionary tales. And Actually, Hannah, when you were summing up the definition of monster, like a monster is something that gets in your way, there is a scholarly field called monster theory. And the guy who like is the guy of monster theory, Jeffrey Jerome Cohen, one of the ways that he defines a monster is that a monster polices the boundaries. And so a monster kind of defines what is acceptable, defines what is possible, and sort of stands at the place where the acceptable shades into the unacceptable as a marker. And so what these stories are doing a lot of the time is kind of standing as a marker and saying, this is, this is too much. This is not acceptable. This is, this is something that makes you monstrous. And the thing that makes you monstrous, you know, it's not like a single thing for each monster. I did kind of deal with it in the book as a single thing for each monster, but (laughs) again, we're just building some metaphors. (laughs) This really (laughs) explains why, as soon as we started trying to define what a monster was in the book, we were like, oh, aren't they all incredibly liminal figures? And it's like, oh, that makes sense, because monsters are, by definition, about their liminality. Like, it's their liminality that makes them a threat. It's like, they're in this in-between space that is, like, not quite human and not quite not human, and that's the danger zone. Yes. And so when you also make them explicitly gender markered, you know, if they're marked out as women, then that is also saying something about like that's that's there for a reason. Is the link between women and monsters using the like pre-existing stigma against women to emphasize the monstrosity of the monsters or is it using the monstrosity of the monsters to argue that women shouldn't be trusted? Or is that just a chicken and the egg situation? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg situ- situation because, because it's, it's kind of both. But also you have to sort of think about who, who are the assumed audience for these stories. And certainly at the time, and like really kind of carrying through today, the assumed audience for all of these stories is always men. So that's something that you know, at a couple of times in the book, I kind of like take a step back and I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm not actually the the intended audience here. So what would this story be like if it were written for me or if it were written for, you know, the monsters in the story? How would they tell their own story? Because like you said, it's both of those things. It's, it's, it's existing as a kind of cautionary tale for people who who might be in danger of becoming monstrous if they overstep these boundaries. And it's also existing as a cautionary tale for the people who are supposed to be, who are supposed to think of themselves as the heroes and supposed to think of themselves as fighting these monsters. I love it's very important for me in my personal development as a woman to have had stories that warned me not to be a whirlpool. (laughs) (laughs) I joke, but it's actually the essay very convincingly argues exactly that. 
I think that is a great prompt, Hannah. I'm wondering if you could give me, but also our listeners who are also not yet familiar with your book, some examples of some of the monsters that you talk about and how you read them metaphorically, like a top three fave or something. <laughs> what do these monsters mean to you? And and how did you how did you come to these conclusions? That kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so Hannah brought up, well, I brought up Charybdis and then Hannah brought up sort of the metaphorical function of Charybdis. So that's that's an interesting one because her entire character is just swallowing things, right? She's a whirlpool. She's voracious. She's constantly referred to as voracious, like that specific word. And in fact, her origin story is that she was a human and she just like kept eating things. Like she just kept consuming things and eventually was turned into this whirlpool like as punishment. That's like many of these stories like only exist in sort of one fragment of one version of whatever. But we do have we do have at least one version of telling the story that way. So that essay is sort of all about hunger and the way that that she fu- as a monster functions as a cautionary tale about hunger and that a lot of us really internalize that story. We don't necessarily get it from Charybdis, right? It's it's simultaneous, you know, we get the story and then also that story is encoded in this particular monster. But, you know, we do, if you're, if you're being raised as, as a woman, you, or as a, you know, as a girl or a woman, you get a lot of messages about whether hunger is acceptable, usually not. And that's physical hunger. It's also like emotional neediness. It's sexual hunger. All of those things are sort of coded as this monstrous voraciousness. So that's what that one is about, and that kind of gives you an idea of of the sort of way that that the book functions. One that I that that I really like this sort of specific story from the Aeneid about the harpies. Um, the harpy chapter is all about ambition, and ambition specifically, not just like oh I want to you know have a good job or a better job or whatever, but just ambition to sort of do anything to take up space to really like exist as a fully functioning being in the world that's something that that if you are sort of being taught to make yourself small and inoffensive reads as ambition um and so there's there's a story about the harpies where Aeneas and his men and Aeneas is you know one of the sort of great epic heroes they see they see this island they're sailing around they see this island they land and they're like, oh, this is a very beautiful island. It has these, you know, it has nice grass for us to lie on. And oh, look, here's some cows just wandering around. Uh, we are going to slaughter these cows and cook them and eat them and, you know, make a sacrifice and then eat the rest and lie around on the grass having a grand old time. The harpies then show up and the harpies are, they're bird women. They have the heads of birds, they have the heads of women and the bodies of birds. They're also... Do they have tits though? They often don't have tits in the, like, in the descriptions, they don't have tits, but they do frequently have tits in, like, drawings or, you know... The last sculptures. unicorn. Yeah, the last... Oh, my God, yeah, the last unicorn. Pendulous tits. Yeah. Virgil is not specific about the tits, but he does talk about how, like, disgusting they are. Like, they're smelly. One of the translations says they have wombs obscene. It's like, I looked at, I looked at them, and I was like, I can tell from looking at that monster. One, it has a uterus, and two, that uterus is bad. <laughs> I feel like yeah. I feel like this is more about whatever the translator had going <laughs> yeah. on then. <laughs> but so they so they show up and they're they're very disgusting and scary apparently. And so the men start to to fight them because their their name comes from the Greek for snatchers. So they're coming down like trying to like get the cows back. Men start to fight them. They chase them off with swords. They eventually corner the sort of main harpy, Selino, and she says, "Excuse me, those are our cows." Like, this was our island. Maybe their father's island, I think. But, like, those cows belong to us. We were just trying to take them back. You actually are the ones who stole it. And to me, that reads as such a, a violation, you know, that they're the monsters and they're just trying to sort of take back what was already theirs. But that's often the way that women's ambition gets treated and gets thought of. You know, one of the things that I that I talk about in the book is like even the ambition to control our own bodies is is seen as sort of overweening you know that we want to make decisions about reproductive choices that we want to make decisions about hormone therapy that we want to make you know any of those are seen as like oh you're you're like trampling on my on my ground we're stealing something that properly belongs to men you're trying to kidnap what i have rightfully stolen yeah <laughs> I'm so taken by the idea that they had to even appeal to 
their own fathers as like a means of legitimizing their rightful claim to the island and these cows. Like it's... Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it makes sense because at least in ancient Greece, women certainly could not own property. Yeah. And also birds couldn't. So really they're... <laughs> <laughs> and their wombs were nasty. <laughs> I think because we're going to be talking about Felis, we should talk about sirens, because even though they're described as harpy-like, they're a lot more siren-like than they are harpy-like. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's interesting about the sirens, they are also bird women. <laughs> and, I mean, it's, it's funny, actually, that sirens have, like, they're now often depicted more as mermaids, but they definitely, like, in Homer, they, they are bird women. But you don't actually see them. Like, I think we're, we're just told that we just hear about that secondhand because their whole deal is that they sing so beautifully from their sort of mist-shrouded island that sailors jump into the water and then drown swimming out to them. Like, the metaphor is sort of obvious, right? It's, it's clearly about kind of seduction. It's about, you know, attraction in a way, but it's about kind of the way that that seduction becomes kind of a, a story that men are telling themselves using women's bodies as kind of a, a canvas, right? Because one thing that we don't know is anything else about sirens, right? We don't know what they're singing about. We don't, we don't really ever see them in these poems. And so, so it's sort of like, well, you jumped in there. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like they were literally just hanging out on a rock singing a song. Hang out on the rock singing a song, and then they become monsters because, like, you couldn't control yourself. So that, I mean, that essay is, a lot of it is about Aerosmith. <laughs> <laughs> it is specifically, a lot of it is about the video for Crazy by Aerosmith. But, it, but it's also about how, like, essentially, you know, seduction is, is, a, is a story that, that men tell themselves about women. And it's something that when you, like, you can choose to sort of participate in it that choice is often constrained. Like one of the things that the, the reason there's a lot of reasons that the, that the music video is in there, but one of them is that like Liv Tyler and Alicia Silverstone go into this gas station shop and they're basically just so beautiful that the guy behind the counter is like, just take whatever you want. And they start like sticking bread in their purse and like <laughs> just like candy and stuff like that. So when you choose to, to take part in that story, it can be sort of a constrained decision where it's like, okay, well, how, how else are you going to get bread? If that's what makes bread be on offer, then that is a way to get bread. But it's also sort of about the fact that like, we don't know and we don't ask what the sirens are actually singing about and whether there is any intention of them to be tempting men into the water in the first place. And in fact, there are stories in which their, their motivation is is to tempt sailors overboard, but it's because if somebody sails past them and doesn't jump in, then they, the sirens, will die. So in some of these stories, it's like they are literally trying to save their lives by sort of participating in this, this kind of back and forth of, of temptation. Which is like, you know, as a woman, if you fail to be adequately seductive, you might as well not exist. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I remember reading a little while ago when I think maybe the Odyssey was translated into English by a woman translator for the first time. Yeah, the Emily Wilson. The Emily Wilson, I believe she was the one who was like, the original Greek says nothing about the sirens being beautiful. That is a thing that male translators constantly put in, that they are sexy, that they are alluring, that they are beautiful. That's nowhere in the original Greek. It is totally just like translators sort of imposing something. What it is, is that their their song draws people in. And that was really making me think, Jess, about the history you sketch out in the introduction to the book about how these classical monsters became sexy and how much that was linked to, like, 19th century anxieties about women's rights. That, like, as women began to fight for suffrage, these cultural depictions began to emerge that were like, things that look like women on the outside are actually monsters on the inside, and you can't trust them. Yeah, no, that is absolutely right. And I actually, I opened the book with this, um, there was a, there was a, an unfortunately tiny, but really wonderful exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, 
just at exactly the time that I needed it to exist when I was when I was trying to sell this book, I think. And it tracked specifically like the way that the faces of these monsters and the, the presentations of these monsters changed from, you know, really kind of frightening and hideous or at least visibly monstrous to, you know, just kind of a snake haired lady who's also, you know, the logo of a fashion brand. <laughs> So the argument that you make in Women and Other Monsters is not a kind of like, hey, turns out women aren't monsters. How about that? (laughs) It's kind of the opposite, that you're like, what becomes possible for us if we embrace monstrosity as a site of potential? So can you talk to us a little bit about this idea of embracing monstrosity or becoming monstrous as a kind of feminist act? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so what we were saying about if the monster is, is kind of the thing that is defining the boundaries and policing the boundaries, if you can make the conscious decision to kind of veer into monstrosity, that means that you have fewer boundaries. Like there are there are fewer barriers on what you can do and what you can be. And so so essentially like deciding to reframe these monsters and think of them as almost role models is just kind of flipping the story on its head. So it it stops being about, oh, this is this is a cautionary tale about what happens if you're too much of this or too much of that. It's a story about, you know, this is what you can aim for because because there aren't a lot of, you know, in these sort of very classic adventure stories, there aren't a lot of other roles for for women or like really anyone but sort of the very masculine hero men. So it's hard to find yourself in that story. And this kind of gives us a way to find ourselves in in that story. If we don't want to be the hero, you know, the sort of Odysseus, egotistical, like, (laughs) fucking his way through Troy kind of thing. (laughs) There's, There's another way to sort of, to tell a story about ourselves that is not constrained and that in fact, like, kind of sees those constraints and says, okay, that's what I want. Like that's what what I want is this vision of somebody who has broken through those constraints and has become something undefinable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. I love it. I was I found it extremely inspiring to be like, oh, be more monstrous. Yes, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> so Hannah informs me that um In your epilogue, you write that women's capacity for birthing monsters is really one of our greatest weapons. And we are recording this episode two and a half weeks before my due date. So I want you to know that I'm like super duper eager (laughs) to know what you mean by birthing monsters and how can reading about monstrous women teach me? I mean, us, you know, us in general, you know, the listener, but but also me, how to do it. <laughs> so, so one of the things that I think is important about birthing monsters is that it's not, you know, that obviously not a biological process. And, and I sort of talked in there, I'm like, there is, there is a kind of version of, there's a very outdated version of feminism that's like, birth is the most beautiful thing that women can do. And that's the thing that makes you a woman. And like, A, that's transphobic, but B, it's just, it's gross. It's so bad. It's so bad. <laughs> However, that said, creating something, generating something like that, that is not biological and that is something that we're often asked not to do, but that is absolutely on the table for us uh, to sort of allow ourselves to overflow these bounds and then to sort of see what comes out of that. So birthing obviously is like, that's, that's another metaphor. <laughs> that's another metaphor. metaphor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you're also welcome to do it literally. Like, if you would like to give birth to a monster, I think that's probably. <laughs> My first child is a Scorpio, so I think I've I think I've accomplished that. Yeah. Also, your first child is a baby hippogriff. Like, that's literally what we called her. So. Yeah. The the claws with which she <laughs> clawed her way out of your body from yeah. my body. <laughs> <laughs> Came out claws first. <laughs> so I feel I have a great deal of confidence, Marcel, in your capacity to continue birthing monsters. I love this. This is great. This is very empowering. Okay. I feel like we've got a great understanding of how to read monstrous women metaphorically. So why don't we why don't we take it back to the book? 
That's a great idea. Last but not least, it's owls, where we apply the theory we've just learned to the book we're reading. So why don't we take a closer look at the specifics of the monstrous women we encounter in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire? We've got to talk about Velas. We've got to talk about Velas. When they are first introduced, they are women. It says, and I quote, Vila were women, the most beautiful women Harry had ever seen, except that they weren't, they couldn't be human. So right there, it's like you can be a woman and not be human. This puzzled Harry for a moment while he tried to guess what exactly they could be, what could make their skin shine moon bright like that, or their white gold hair fan out behind them without wind. And then the music started, and Harry stopped worrying about them not being human. In fact, he stopped worrying about anything at all. So right off the bat, we've got this, like, these are the first monstrous women we're meeting in this book, and it's like, they're women... They're not human. But they're women. And they're the most beautiful women. They're so white. They're like better women for not being human. Well, I mean, it's interesting that it says they couldn't be human, right? Because it's it makes it sound like, oh, they couldn't be human because they're so beautiful. Because there's no other reason that that you would leap to that conclusion, right? Yeah. And that's the same thing that Ron says about Fleur when he sees her later on after the Beaubaton students arrive. Ron's like, she must be part Vila. No human women look like that. Yeah. Doesn't he say something like they don't make them like that at Hogwarts or something like that? <laughs> yeah, and, then, and then Harry <laughs> looks at Cho and then he's like, I think they make them pretty okay or something like that. And it's like, okay, bros. And that's feminism. <laughs> <laughs> You did it. You did it. I disagree. I think human women are good to fuck. Wow. Wow. We we stand an ally. Harry, such a good ally. Mm. So this sort of takes the whole siren idea a step further, right? Because it's locating like the monstrosity and the fear in specifically like the beauty, right? Like that's what makes them threatening. I mean, it kind of like it kind of goes back to the idea of sirens as being kind of drafted into this story about temptation. So like we've got it established up front that they're dangerous because they're so beautiful. And Harry, again, sort of not unlike the story of the sirens, Harry almost hurls himself out of the stand, like, you know, endangers himself like a sailor leaping from a ship and has to be restrained by the Odysseus-like Arthur Weasley. But then their monstrosity gets like emphasized when they get mad. So when they're happy, they're beautiful, but then they get mad. The text says they lose control. And then it says, Harry saw that they didn't look remotely beautiful now. On the contrary, their faces were elongating into sharp, cruel-beaked bird heads, and long, scaly wings were bursting from their shoulders. Um, And they also throw handfuls of fire. So, what's the deal with sexy ladies turning into birds? I mean, I hate it. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's real. I mean, it's really like... In, in terms of this monster, like, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, right? Like, it's it's very, it's very, very scary and unnatural and dangerous specifically to men that you're so beautiful. And then it's also very, very scary and unnatural and dangerous to men that you, I guess, react negatively to anything. They're, they're hiding, like, they're their monstrous, scary face behind their monstrous, beautiful face, but they at no point get to just be people. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But like part of what makes them monstrous in their beautiful form is that they are hiding everything from you, like kind of hiding, like they're still immediately recognizable as not human, but not as monsters. I guess that's the distinction. Also, I mean, and this is this is unfortunate, but probably true. If they're supposed to be kind of the the male ideal, right, if they're supposed to be like the perfect woman, probably like there people are not fantasizing about a woman with wings they just didn't think to put wings on on the fantasy so like in order to like perfectly adhere to this kind of like fantasy woman perfect ideal vision 
they can't have any other markers besides being perfect and ideal. You have to be thin, white, blonde, no wings, no beaks. Right. (laughs) And you have to dance. And you got to dance at sporting events. Honestly, you just have to be a cheerleader. Cheerleader. Seems to be what they are. (laughs) Um, Their capacity to transform unpredictably is referenced later around Fleur's wand, because we find out that Fleur is one quarter Vila, which is why she is like slightly unnaturally beautiful and her hair always seems to be in a in a breeze, which is an amazing superpower. And Ron can't control himself whenever he's around her. Which is absolutely not his fault and entirely her fault for not being fully human. And then Ollivander says that he doesn't like making wands with Vila hair because they're too unpredictable. Mm-hmm. So there is this like hint of monstrosity around Fleur. Like she's two generations removed from being what we saw on that field. But she is still just monstrous enough to be a threat to our protagonists, a threat to the sort of inevitable romantic relationship we're supposed to see coming with Ron and Hermione. And like, spoiler alert, in subsequent books, she will continue to be massively vilified as a suspiciously sexy woman who has entrapped a man. Yeah. If I may, I would like to set up a dichotomy. (laughs) Oh! (laughs) If I may. Okay, I was thinking about this as I was doing my preparatory reading, and I was thinking about how Rita Skeeter uses the fact of Hagrid's giantess mother as a way of vilifying and dehumanizing him. And I was thinking about why it is that Fleur's Vila grandmother does not seem to pose a problem for her in the same kind of acceptably pure-bloodedly human kind of way. Because we do see that Vila's are made monstrous. So then I was also thinking about how Madame Maxime is so, so afraid to acknowledge the fact that she has giant blood. I even feel icky saying, like, she has giant blood, but you you know what I mean. Scare quotes around everything. She is part giant, yeah. Yeah, and the way that she is also depicted in the book as being, like, so regal and so in control and so, like, so incredibly feminine in spite of her size. So for her, she really has to compensate for her monster parent or monster grandparent, whoever. Whereas Fleur is like, oh, it was my grandmother's. (laughs) My grandmother was a villa. (laughs) This little boy. (laughs) This little boy. (laughs) I have a theory. I think it has to do with the fuckability. (laughs) <laughs> of the various <laughs> monsters. Mm, tell me more. <laughs> That's going to be the next chart I make. But it appears to be like kind of an accepted normal thing that sometimes wizards have kids with velas. So in that sense, velas are like, yeah, they're, they can be really dangerous. And like, yeah, you know, a practical man like Arthur Weasley knows you shouldn't choose one. But like, some sillier men will choose one. You know, the French. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. It's it's clearly anti-French sentiment. (laughs) But like, you know, clearly some men have bad enough judgment that they choose to fuck a Vila. But the only narrative example we ever have of somebody sleeping with a giant is Hagrid's father, And that is narratively positioned as being, like, a really weird aberration. And is set up narratively in a way that is, like, really about emasculating Hagrid's father. Because he's so small in comparison to his wife. So it's like, if you fuck Avila, it's dangerous, but you've conquered an extremely sexy woman. But if you fuck a giant, there's something wrong with you. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like it's a, it's about what your wizard pals are going to say, like, if you tell them in the bar or whatever. You know, like, you fuck a Vila, then people are like, hey, fuck a Vila. 
That was probably really dangerous. Could have gotten talent. <laughs> but you fuck a giant and it's, I don't know. I don't know. I can't finish that sentence. Yeah, no, I mean, because it, cause it, cause it is emasculating. Because if it's like a female giant, then it's like, oh, she's real big. Like she's tall and and big and strong. And like that's, none of those are supposed to be feminine attributes. It's not going to be something that you like brag about. Yeah. And the two examples of half giants we have, Hagrid doesn't really go to any effort to hide his giantness because it is perfectly reconcilable with masculinity. But Madame Maxime has to like really contort herself to like work against her giantness to make herself more acceptably feminine. I don't like it. <laughs> Dang, the patriarchy. Still a bummer. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> All right. I want to talk about mer people. One, they are established right up front as being a surprise when Harry encounters them because he has been looking at the sexy mermaid in the <laughs> painting in the prefect's bathroom. Let's talk another day about how the prefect's bathroom has sexy mermaids in it. It's fine. That's a topic for another day. But the actual mer people he meets are like fishy. Mm -hmm. So they have grayish skin, long, wild, dark green hair. I don't understand why more people would have hair, but that's fine. <laughs> their eyes are yellow, as were their broken teeth. No dentistry in the Mer people kingdom. They wore thick ropes of pebbles around their necks. Also very silly. Pearls literally come from the water. They could easily have pearls. They leered at Harry as he swam past. One or two of them emerged from their caves to watch him better. Their powerful silver fish tails beating the water. Spears clutched in their hands. And then we meet the chief Mer person who is a particularly wild and ferocious looking female, which calling somebody a female makes you sound like a Ferengi. <laughs> <laughs> but that is beside the point. So I find these, these monstrous mer people fascinating that there's like this civilization in the lake of monsters with a uh, language and a culture and musical stylings. Fashion. <laughs> rock-based fashion. There's no reference to clothing, so do you think he sees some mertits? I mean, sort of sounds like he sees them, but he's not excited about them, and that's, and he, like, holds that against the mer people. Oh, like, the problem with these mer people is that they do not look like this sexy mermaid that I was led to expect. <laughs> Jess, your point about Harry, like, not liking them because they let down his image of the mermaid really returns to this like how do how much do we like different monsters well it depends on how much they satisfy our like 14 year old pubescent fantasies about what we think women ought to be they are again you know they're monsters because they're standing in between him and what he wants right the thing he wants is i mean ron his wheezy primarily but then also all of these ladies he would also like to save but like you know, their monstrosity is that they are not sort of objects of his desire. They are barriers to the thing that he is trying to accomplish. I mean, contrasting these like fishy mermaids specifically with like doing it explicitly in the text, contrasting them with with sort of the image of the very beautiful, like more humanoid mermaid seems like it sets them up. If I may make a dichotomy. <laughs> Kind of in opposition to Vila's, right? Like, here's here's a creature that could be, you know, sort of enacting this male gazy fantasy that I had that I had expected to be doing that, and instead they're doing something completely different that maybe makes much more sense for them in their actual individual life. Like, for instance, they do not need tits for for anything other than display purposes, <laughs> but that that sort of codes them as monstrous, even though. Like, it makes sense for them. And also, I guess they're not acting as a threat. Maybe they are. I don't remember. I mean, I've, I remember that, that they exist, but I don't remember if they're, if they're scary. They're definitely perceived as threatening. But, like, the mer dude who tries to stop Harry just keeps laughing at him. And so it's also not clear. Is it supposed to be a legitimate threat? Or are they just like, nah, dude, you can't rescue all of them. Get out of here. They say, like, you're not allowed. You're only allowed to take one. You're not allowed to use tools. Like, 
it seems clear that they have just been given a set of instructions and are playing a role in this competition. And so they are just, you know, keeping the rules because that's what their role is. But because they are not humans, they are monsters, their enforcing of the rules is represented as monstrous rather than literally they are like employees of Hogwarts in this capacity <laughs> who are just <laughs> who are just doing what they've been what they've been told to do as employees. Ooh. But I think it's also significant that Harry is able to overpower them. And he overpowers them because he has a wand, and they are terrified of wand magic. And that is another significant distinction for who counts, not between creatures and monsters, but between monsters and humans in these books, is the ability to have a wand is what makes you a person. And so the fact that Harry is able to use, despite being 14, is able to use his wand to single-handedly scare off these, like, adult Mer people with their big spears and powerful fish tails. It is. It tells us something about the importance of heroes being able to beat monsters for sure. With wands, I mean, this also feels like a metaphor. I have to say, yeah, wands are dicks for sure. <laughs> yeah. I also can't help but be confused by the fact that all of these mer people just saw Harry choose a rock from the sea or lake floor or whatever and hack off the rope when he had a wand the whole time and then he pulls out his wand like stay back like he doesn't know how to use that you just saw him not use the wand for a simple like rope undoing spell or not undoing spell <laughs> he can only do one thing with the wand he did it to keep the grindelows at bay he can shoot hot water at you <laughs> Because he can't talk to do any actual spells, so he can just sort of flail, and the wand just shoots hot water. <laughs> and I just feel like these, like, adult mer people could, like, outsmart a 14-year-old with, like, a, essentially a water gun. <laughs> <laughs> you, like, knock the wand out of his hand with your trident. Like, come on, you guys. Just hold him down until the spell runs out. <laughs> All right, Marcel, before we finish up, I think there's one more monster you want to talk about. You know, when I was reading all of the things about all of the lady monsters in this book, I just kept thinking about how Molly Weasley is represented when she's mad. And she is just so clearly and consistently represented as becoming monstrous. And I just think it's so funny that it's Arthur Weasley who sees the Vilas get mean and angry and turn into scary monster ladies, or scary monster birds, I guess, instead of sexy, beautiful ladies. And he's like, that's why you don't go for looks alone. I'm like, you are literally afraid of your wife whenever she gets mad. Is this a, like, do as I say, not as I do, boys? Or... Or that the practical thing to do is to choose a woman based on qualities other than looks because all women are monsters underneath. And so if you're going to choose a woman, choose one that will do all of the housework for you. They've all got secret beaks, but at least some of them will make sure that you've got a warm dinner waiting for you when you get home. Yeah, they're all going to hen peck you to death. So make sure... That they're knitting you sweaters while they do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's all I wanted to say. Just a <laughs> shout out to monstrous women who are monstrous without needing to transform into anything. <laughs> <laughs> May we all achieve that. Thank you, witches, for joining us for another episode of Witch Please. You can find the rest of our episodes by heading over to NotSorryWorks.com or, of course, wherever podcasts are found. If you want to hang out with us more, we're on Twitter and Instagram at OhWitchPlease. Jess, where can people find you and your book if they want to know more about your work? Yeah, I'm also on Twitter and Instagram under J underscore Zims, Z-I-M-M-S. And there's a uh, easiest way to find book information, including like links to IndieBound and Bookshop is at my website, which is JessZimmerman.com. Amazing. Everybody go buy this book. It's so good. 
Which Please is produced in partnership with Not Sorry and distributed by Acast. Special thanks to Not Sorry for having us and to our team player of a producer, Hannah Rehack, a.k.a. Coach. Thanks, Coach. If you're into the podcast, why don't you let us know by dropping a review on Apple Podcasts. At the end of every episode, we'll shout out everyone who left us a five-star review. So you've got to review us if you want to hear me have a small existential crisis while trying to say your usernames aloud, seeing them for the first time (laughs) while recording. Thanks this week to Teeny Tiny Tyne, Kind and Peculiar, Microposh, um, Seldomer, C, C, is it like, is this like C, C Quay, like Segway, or like CQ, like C, CQ, C, 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 Live, Live Katinka, Mad About Forests, and Roar Bibliosaurus Rex. Very appropriate for uh, for this week's episode. If you want to hear even more from us, don't forget to head over to patreon.com slash ohwitchplease, where you can find, among other things, an increasingly unhinged series of Q&A segments that at this point we might as well call Witch Please After Dark. <laughs> we will be back next episode to continue our discussion of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. But until then... Later, witches.